Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 82. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Amber. Hello, everyone. And we're going to be talking about Reiner Knizia. Unfortunately, Reiner Knizia is not here, but his games are here. They're all around us. Also, Mark is in a very goofy mood. They're everywhere. Look, there's a game. There's a game. There's two, three, two or three over there because we've been playing them. All Reiner Knizia games. He is our most prolific board game designer. He's made over 600 games. 600? 600. He makes games left and right. But you've only rated, what, Don't... 10 of them? <laughs> <laughs> Look, we got to talk about Reiner Knizia at some point, right? How many how many games of Reiner Knizia do I have to play before I can talk about them on the podcast? Fair. Okay, so we I've have done, enough to talk about. There are plenty of good games on here. I've done a, I've rated eleven of his games, and I don't think I'm missing any. To be fair, three of those are the same game. <laughs> so really, it's <laughs> seven. Really, it's eight. nine. <laughs> oh, nine. Yeah, because you get rid of two of those three. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. so okay. really nine games. Anyways, I'm excited about Reiner Knizia. Uh, I'm realizing now that if I label this podcast, like title it. Reiner Knizia, people are going to think that I scored an interview with Reiner Knizia, which is kind of hard to do, and I haven't, uh, so sorry if you're listening for that, uh, but Amber and I have been playing lots of Reiner Knizia games, and we're going to talk about them as a designer. So, I think the first thing I want to talk about is the unfair reputation that Reiner Knizia gets, and I don't know if you're aware of this reputation, Amber. Okay, well, before you say he has a reputation, let me say something about his games. Okay. And then maybe it will kind of get at his reputation. Maybe you're one of them. Maybe. I think his games have the perfect mixture of luck and strategy to make it a fun and engaging game at all times. Satisfying even if you lose. Even if you lose to a someone else's lucky draw. That's a very good. I mean, why would he not? Why would I be mad at that reputation? I mean, that's true. Okay, but I but I'm used to playing with you and Orion and a couple others who don't like the element of luck as much in your games, and I what love you, it. Uh, I don't know about that. Okay, okay, okay. Our favorite games are all lucky, except for uh, I mean, even Spirit Island has a lot of luck. Does it? What's our favorite like super low luck game? Through the ages, maybe? Hmm. Okay, well... I mean, like, Twilight and Both the Twilights have good amounts of luck. Mm. Gloomhaven does. Uh... Okay, well, Reiner Knizia executes it perfectly, and I enjoy his games. Okay, here's, here's the Reiner Knizia reputation from certain very influential board game people who will not go name, but are perhaps the most influential board game people. So everyone knows who you're talking about. Oh, the, e- yeah. Except me, maybe. They know <laughs> who I'm talking about. Uh, the reputation is that Reiner Knizia is makes math games that are themeless and mathy and uh, have no excitement to them. Wait, really? Yeah. Okay, well... Well, first of all... Maybe it, I haven't I mean, played... Part of it plays into the fact that he is a mathematician. Okay, well, I haven't played that many of his Or at his least games. a math teacher. I'm not sure. He he does have his PhD. That's why he's the good doctor. Okay, well, we're definitely going to have to talk about this then because I have a love-hate relationship with math. But I don't think this is earned from the games that I have played. Okay, well, let's go through the, the games. Um, here are the 11 I've played. So the three that are the same game are Battle Line, Battle Line Medieval, and Shot and Totten. The only difference with Shot and Totten is that besides the art is that the cards go one through nine instead of one through 10. Oh, you told me about this. Yeah. yeah. So it's the same game. Uh, I've also played modern art, lost cities, the quest for El Dorado through the desert, Stevenson's rocket, my city, Babylonia and Medici, the card game. And, and I will say I, I've, I've arrived at the brilliance of Reiner Knizia late. There are many of his like all time classics that I haven't yet played. Uh, most notably would be Tigris and Euphrates, uh, and then the rest of the of the auction games other than modern art. So uh, High Society, Raw, and are those the only other two? 
those would be the three games of his, I think, that are like super notable that I haven't yet played. Actually, let me look that up. What are his other super, super notable games? So in terms of how often, how many times they've been rated on Board Game Geek, the ones I haven't played are Tigris and Euphrates, Raw, Ingenious. I forgot about that one. I think I was supposed to get a review copy of that at some point. Uh, Samurai, which I think is similar to Babylonia. Uh, the, the original Lord of the Rings game, which doesn't sound that fun. Uh, High Society, Amon Ray, Blue Moon. And then we get to probably what, what people consider, I think, lesser or like second tier Kinesias. So, the, yeah, those would be the big ones I haven't played. Uh, but regardless, I, I've played a, a decent number of them. Uh I believe Amber has played all the ones I listed except for El Dorado, Through the Desert, and Stevenson's Rocket. Yes, I I don't object to playing any of these except maybe Stevenson's Rocket. And I think it's just because Mark tried to get me to play it so hard over so many days. Amber, it's so good. And now that so much pressure has been placed on me to play it, it's I have so no good. interest. It may be my favorite. Really? Yes. It doesn't sound very interesting. It's so good, Amber. Okay. It's so good. It's one of those games where you have no good choices. Well, I don't constantly. like those games. And it's 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 all about tempo. It's all about finding I know, I know. The way you've described this to me while trying to get me to play it. Is probably the opposite strategy you should pursue with me. So, okay. We'll talk about Stevenson's Rocket later. Okay. Okay. So, what do you think about this dry math reputation he has? Do you think his games are dry and mathy? No. I mean, to be fair, they're all numbers. Uh, but, But it's not heavy calculations like yes you can see the math in them but when i am playing the games i do not feel like i'm doing math here's the thing i came up with that i wrote in my battle line review which you have not read but you should Mm -hmm. because i think it is a good review and i realized that what reiner canetia brings with his games isn't dryness it's clarity his games are very clear there's no fat to them i mean above anything He's like the ultimate editor. His games are so stripped down and to the point compared to other games that it's kind of remarkable. I mean, I love that. And that's probably why I don't feel like I'm doing math, even when working with numbers. Because it uncomplicates what is normally very complicated. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And, you know, it's in this tradition of the German style game, the German family game. Uh, and he's kind of the, one of the few really hanging on to that. Uh, there's him, there's, uh, the brands. So the, the couple that designs the exit games, they Mm -hmm. seem to do more of these German family style games. And I think I've talked about this a couple of times before on the podcast, but when we think about Euro games, the original Euro game, we, we, when people mention Euro games now, they think of mathematical and they think of uh, low randomness or no randomness and a good amount of complexity. But that's not what Euro games originally were back in the 90s, early 2000s. The Euro game thing was less luck, not no luck. I mean, the most famous Euro game of all time is Catan, and that has dice. Yeah. Right? In card drawing. It has like like fun. The fundamental mechanism of Catan is dice, uh, determining your resources. Uh, so less luck than like American style, like Sorry or Risk, which is you know all luck, all luck pretty much, and eliminating player elimination, um, and a, a little bit more focus on growth rather than destruction. But also the Euro game thing was that they're family games, like the spiel, the spiel had to introduce a new category for more complex games because of what Americans and other countries and Europeans started doing, uh, particularly if you look at like Feld and Rosenberg, uh, started doing to make the idea of your games more complex. So I think there's enough history here where we can define a split. Um, and in fact, I've conceived of a split in three different ways uh, of the Euro game. You have the original like German family style game 
So that's going to be what Kinesia does a lot, what the spiel likes uh, for the basic spiel. The Yara's award, typically. Uh, the what I'm going to call like the heavy, the economic game. Uh, and that's going to be your more complex, like no luck or super low luck, brutal economic games. So kind of coming from the splatter. So the people who made Food Chain Magnate. I'm thinking Agricola. Design. Yeah, I mean, Agricola kind of fits in there. You've got maybe maybe Power Grid is kind of the intermediary case between... Because when Power Grid came out, that was considered like a heavy game. But now we'd consider it a medium weight game. And I would say that's kind of like maybe indicative of like a transition point. Uh, and then the third category is what I call the Baroque Euro. And that's like the Lacerda or Feld style game where you have lots of moving parts, complex, uh, low luck. Uh, but it's about mastering the game rather than mastering your opponents as much. And so with the economic style games, you get stuff like Container, 18xx games, and again, Power Grid's kind of a lighter version of that, or, or Splatter games, uh, where it's much more opponent-focused uh, and much more of, uh, about battling your opponents and kind of brutal and unforgiving, but not the like super like gears within gears style of the Baroque Euro. Anyways, uh, Reiner Knizia makes German-style family games, uh, and he's so good at it. So, so good. In fact, of the 11 games I listed, the only one I really didn't like was Through the Desert. And to be fair, I did play that at four players, and I believe most people think it's best at two players. And I did play it in a uh, setting where a lot of people had drank a lot. So maybe I would like it two players and more sober. I don't know. Uh, but I think uh, Babylonia takes a lot of the ideas of Through the Desert and maybe improves upon them. That's the idea of uh, what Reiner Knizia typically does. I wonder what his heaviest game is. Is there a way to look this up? Yeah, there is. Tigris and Euphrates is his heaviest game. Did we play that at some point? I've never played it. It sounds so familiar. It's a very famous game. And it has a rating of 3.5. I mean, Stevenson's Rocket is not that difficult. It's got a 3.06. So, like, his heaviest games are midweight games. Okay. And very quickly you get to, I don't know, what's Taj Mahal? A 3. You get, I mean, Babylonia is on this first page here. So, he's making pretty light games. and That's at a a 2.5. He's making games around that basic light mm-hmm. uh, range, two out of five complexity range mostly. And I think he, he's just so good at it because I think he, like you talked about, he has this balance of luck and uh, skill. But I think more than most light games, the balance is tipped towards skill. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, but they're fun. And, and I know what you're saying about theme and theme kind of taking second second place to the math. And maybe I agree with that, because when I'm playing Lost Cities, I don't feel like I'm an adventurer, but I do like the art. I think it feels... What's the right word? <clears throat> it feels like an adventure when I'm playing it. Okay. Not, not super, super thematic. It's more feeling like an adventure in an abstract way, but that's okay because it's kind of an abstract game. Yeah, I, I think I think Lost Cities is actually one of his least thematic games. But I think the mm-hmm. idea that he is non-thematic, he, he makes non-thematic games, I think is nonsense. I think he picks very appropriate themes for his games, typically. I mean, you yeah. look at Battle Line, I talked about, again, you got to read my review, Amber. I don't tell you to okay, read many okay. of my reviews, but this <laughs> one I thought was quite good. Uh, <laughs> but in Battle Line, I think it feels like a battle. Yeah. It feels like the preparation and the execution of a battle. Because your first few plays are, you have no idea what's coming. Yeah. And you're just kind of poking around in like, uns- it's like that that before the battle moment mm-hmm. uh, where everyone's like uncertain and looking around like, what do we do? Yep. Are we ready? That's how the game plays out. And then in the middle, it's just a big old rush. 
And then towards the end, you've got to be very precise and strategic about it to try to pull out the victory. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it has a nice arc. I think Lost Cities doesn't. I think modern art is obviously very thematic. Very. Modern art is, is, a, is a, a satire. Yeah. It's a straight up satire of the art industry. And if that's not thematic, like what is? Like how are we defining thematic if that is not thematic? Oh yeah, it was so thematic that the people we got to play it with us who don't ever play board games were into it. They felt like ruthless art dealers doing crazy things to manipulate the price of the art. And they said it felt very real. A um, little bit like how art plays out in the real world. Maybe not that, um, uh, what's the right word? Uh, I would just say, maybe not that aggressive, <laughs> like, <laughs> like my younger sister likes to say. <laughs> um, and even something like My City, like it's not super thematic, but it's got nice touches. Mm-hmm. Um, as we progress through the campaign, it's got, you know, you're building up, you're adapting to different things that happen. Uh, it's got little thematic touches in there, uh, more so than a lot of other games and i think i'm just realizing this i think what it is is that kinesi is never anti-thematic you never have the dissonance yeah yeah i would agree with that the biggest problem with so many games that are trying to be thematic like they're big fantasy adventures with all these minis and like hundreds of unique cards and art and everything is that the mechanical connection to the game often not isn't isn't just like tentatively thematic or maybe even non-thematic it's anti-thematic in other yeah. words it is against the feelings and the decision making that you should have in that position uh it is the opposite and it throws you out of the game and it drives me nuts it drives me absolutely nuts we just played a game a couple of weeks ago that was like this which not one only, uh Ar- archangel i forget mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to have a review of it up soon. But I would say almost an anti-thematic game. Hmm. You're supposed to be this this wizard slinging spells about, but it's all about, like, instead, your score is based on how much you're upgrading your spells rather than, like, actually utilizing your spells in any way, which doesn't really make sense. There's no, like, finale to it. Like, I can see where the score... Uh, you know, the score being affected by how you upgrade your spells could be good if you then got to use those spells. But it's like, mm-hmm. okay, now you upgraded your spells, the game's over. And now we count how many spell points you got. Hmm. Uh, drive me nuts. I don't think, I don't think Knizia, at least in the games I played, are anti thematic. There's yeah. some where, okay, through the desert, it's sketchy. Lost Cities, it's sure, there's not much going on there. Babylonia, maybe I can dig and find something. But uh, in Stevenson's Rocket in my city, even in Medici, or Quest for El Dorado, um, which you haven't played, like that one feels like an adventure much more than Lost Cities and it has a similar theme of adventuring. And I think in Battleline, and especially Modern Art, are very thematic games. Mm-hmm. Modern Art is. Battleline, it's got something going for it. And maybe this is just I'm the weirdo in how I think about theme. Well, maybe you are. I think I'm on board with your interpretation, though, because you're talking about dissonance. It's something that resonates with me, and I can't provide a concrete example. I I would have to really think about it. But well, some... here's how I here's how I think about it. Right, mm-hmm. a game, a thematic moment in a game is when the decision presented to me like the what decision i have mirrors the decision that my character would have at that moment yeah or the type of decision i have it just feels natural yes um i would say with the kinesia games i've played it it feels natural um, i'm going with the flow of the game everything makes sense it feels very satisfying it feels very engaging um, and that's definitely in contrast to some more thematic games that I've played where I can't remember the rules because the decisions don't make sense. And I, I'm i trying to think of the games that I've played recently, but there have been several bigger ones recently that I've played with you where mid-game, I am like, that's a rule? And I get really angry with you. Well, I mean, because... that's also like complex games. But it's because it doesn't make sense. 
and I'm going through the flow of decision making and it doesn't make sense. And I know that the rule was stated at some point, um, but I'd forgotten about it because it doesn't make sense with the theme of the game. So with that said, I'm not saying he's the most thematic designer in the world, but the idea of these like no theme at all is nonsense. Nonsense. He's better than many, many people. Let's talk about some specifics. Let's start at the top. Lost Cities. That is your favorite, right? <laughs> I think it's my favorite. Um, I, I may have Battle Lines or Modern Art grow on me, but mostly it's my favorite because I win all the time. Did you tell all your podcast audience about our epic battle? Oh, yeah. So if you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel, you should be. Uh, because uh, we have videos every once in a while. I got streams going, all that good stuff. And uh, Amber and I had an epic Lost Cities battle, because at some point, was it on the podcast, or was it just after a game or something? It was randomly, after you had just showed me your ratings on the Lost Cities online. Yes. Well, I had played whatever. Lost Cities hundreds of times in preparation of writing a online. strategy article online. Online. I played over a thousand games over the years. And uh, I, I said, I think I could beat you now because you had always beaten me before. You're very good at the game. Always. I always won. And I said, no, I'm better than you now. And so we had a streamed match. No, 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 no. What? You said you were better than me. And then I laughed and very confidently said no way because even if you were the champion of online games, the experience is different in person. And I knew I would always win. Always. And so we went back and forth on Wait, this. Is now the thing that you will always win? No, 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 no. I only have to beat you in one match? No, no, no. Win the game. You can win a couple of matches. You di I think you did win no, one. No, the match is the set of games. Yes, yes. I will always win two out of three. All right. Well, that's a lower <laughs> bar for me to cross. I just got to beat you two out of three once. <laughs> you won't do it. Wow, we gotta do, another, do we gotta do another rematch. I can do it. Mm. I was at one point I was the thirteenth or sixteenth. I forget. I was in the teens ranked player in the world. Okay, well, in, board game arena. In my opinion, it's a different experience in person because Lost Cities is one of those games where you are playing the person as much as you're playing the cards. And so, yes, it's very mathematical. You're calculating it out a lot. You're trying to determine the tempo. Um, but if you have two smart players who can count, like the two of us, it's all about manipulating the tempo. And to do that, you have to see how the other person is playing their cards. You have to see their face. It's part of the experience. And I think I will always win against Mark. I, I don't I don't say that I would this rise in the ranks online, but I will always win against Mark. This is an incredible amount of confidence, and now I'm confident yes. that I can, I can overcome this. No. Oh. Well, you should you should all watch our online match because it was very fun. Well, now there's going to be a rematch in the next couple of weeks. Let's do it. Rematch. I don't know about a couple of weeks. Maybe a couple months. A couple of weeks. A couple of months. I'm scheduling it. I'm going to put it on the calendar give, right now. Give me some time. It's I've played so many Reiner Knizia games over the last couple of weeks. You've played <laughs> two Reiner Knizia games. Many rounds of battle lines. <laughs> That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, Lost Cities. What do you think of it? I love it. Why do you love it? Uh, did I just say why I love it? No, you said why you were going to beat me. <laughs> Is that why you love it? Well, okay, that's one Victory? reason. One reason, it definitely factors into why this is one of my favorites because I feel like I can win it a lot. Um, but I think it's so, so simple. It's something you can play in five minutes. Um, it's something that I am almost always down to play, um, where the thought of playing a long, heavy game sometimes means I won't play any game at all. This is one that I can often be convinced to play, um, and it doesn't take much prodding. It's very enjoyable, very light, very fun. And fast. And fast, yeah. Not only the game is fast, like you can get through a game in 10 minutes at most. Uh, you, yeah. you, the plays are fast. You can just go back and forth, snappy, snappy. Mm -hmm. I mean, online, you finish games in under two minutes. Yeah. I mean, I've always really liked speed games, so maybe that is a big reason why I like this one. Um, I just find it to be a very pleasant experience all the time. Yeah, it's a very good game. And then Battle Line feels like a variation on it, almost. And this is something that Reiner Knizia does a lot. He'll take an idea and he'll add... He'll... he'll 
he'll just make four or five games based around that idea. Uh, and and I think this is probably how those games. Are. Yeah, they were released a year apart, so I think mm-hmm. he was on this like what I call a column battle game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm coining this term because there's a lot of them. I have like four or five. I have Lost Cities, I have Battle Line, I have Hanabi Koji, I have Airland and Sea, and I think there's a fifth. I am not remembering. Remember, maybe one of the Button Shy games. I forget. Hmm. Uh, but these like column battle games where you're trying to win columns. I like them. Yeah, I think th- they're a very good design, but I think he kind of invented them. Uh, I think there's another one called Celtis that is more similar to Lost Cities, but uh, let's talk about Battle Line because we just finished playing it. I mm-hmm. think it's brilliant. This is one that Mark has won far more times than I have won. I believe I have won seven out of ten games over the, the last couple of days. Yeah, yeah but... In comparison to Lost Cities, it's less about tempo. There are There is some tempo management in Battle Lines, but it's very restricted on what you can do there. Um, I think the reason that I win Lost Cities a lot is I'm really good at managing that against Mark specifically. Um, and Battle Lines, I don't know. I don't know. Why do you think you win most of the time? Uh, I think... I don't know. I think the I I don't know what the strategy is. I'm playing by my gut, but I think you have to. The better you can identify what's won and what's lost and what can still be fought over, sooner uh, you have a better chance. I've been doing a strategy where I try to go pretty broad in the beginning, and not commit to too much because you want to get more information before you start committing to cards, and. Then once I've committed to a three card grouping, really going hard on those and trying to get you to where you uh, lose tempo. So in other words, you can't play as many cards as you want in that column. Mm -hmm. And then by the end game, that can maybe put you in a lurch. Uh, But I, I, I haven't I haven't solidified why I'm winning more here. Yeah, I've done some of that strategy as well, and I always feel like I'm managing the cards well um, and doing a bunch of different things, so I don't know why you win that one more. We'll have to explore that further. we got to explore that. There's a lot yeah. more in that game. Uh, let me just briefly mention the ones that Amber hasn't played. So uh, the Quest for Eldorado I found to be a pleasant game, but I found it more so to be a remarkable game in how... Uh, Reiner Knizia basically set out to set, to make like the ultimate beginner's deck building game, and then not only included really the fundamental basics of what makes be- deck building fun, but also a bunch of really clever mechanisms to actually teach people how to play deck builder games as you're playing the game. So for someone who's played hundreds of games of Dominion like me, it felt you know, it was like, well, I've seen all this before. But if someone's never played a deck builder, that's the one to play because it literally just teaches you how to play deck b- builders as you're playing it, which is which is really cool. And I do like the board aspect of it. Uh, I think if you added a bit more complexity, and I think there are expansions, uh, I might like it a bit more. I, I thought it was quite pleasant, but I wasn't itching to play again because it, it was, again, a lot of concepts I'd played. I'd played out a lot. Uh, but very, very impressive game. Through the Desert, like I said, I wasn't super impressed, but I can totally see why it would shine at two players. In a multiplayer situation, I think we played with five, uh, if it accepts five. We played with the max player count, you I said think. four. It was four or five. Uh, and that kind of situation, it felt fairly rote. Like, you kind of knew what you needed to do. And then... You said you don't remember playing Medici, but I'm pretty sure you played Medici the card game. Maybe? I've been told the base game, the regular Medici is superior, but I, I really like the card game. I think it's it's fun. I don't think it's great, but uh, it's it's very simple again. Like, Canizia distills games down to, like, to their essence, and it has two things. It has set collection in a really f- neat way, and it has push your luck. Uh, and that's kind of the two mechanisms he's playing with there. And I think he does a pretty good job of it. Uh, the first time I played it was a hoot. It was like late in the day, in the evening, at a convention. We played with the full six-player count, which is probably best. And the push-your-luck aspect gets an additional layer of momentum and excitement 
in a late night uh, six player game where everyone's challenging everyone else to be brave and not give up and you know go for the gold that kind of thing uh, but uh, but again like all of his games a lot underneath the surface with Medici the card game uh, and I am looking forward at some point to playing the the base game because people have told me that's far superior in which case I'm very interested in oh and then Stevenson's rocket it's brilliant it's a tempo game it's in 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 Orion and I think Baba hated it when they played it I remember that they thought it was so rote and boring and there were no decisions they didn't understand Amber Oh, I remember your discussions about they this. They didn't understand. They were giving me opportunities left and right. They weren't thinking it through. It appears like your decisions don't matter, but every decision, in fact, matters so much. It matters so much that it doesn't look like it matters. Wait, so didn't you all podcast about this and discuss this? A little bit, yeah. Did you bring them over to your side, or are they still adamant? I think maybe Bubba would play it again. I don't think Orion would play it again. Stevenson's Rocket is a game in which you want to put everyone... It's it's a Zugzwing game. What's that? From chess. Zugzwing? It's... A Zugzwing situation in chess is a situation where none of your moves are good. It would be better for you to pass. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what Stevenson's Rocket is about. It's about putting all of your opponents in a situation where none of their moves help them. But they have to do something. Mark, you're not selling this game. It's so no, good, Amber. It's so good. No one wants to be in that position. <laughs> but everyone wants to put other people in that position. Uh, Amber, it's, it's tough. So good. It's tough. It's so good. So I, I definitely want to talk about since you brought up chess in this context and also in Babylonia, but just some some chess uh, lessons. Uh, that I brought over to the other games. I just want to mention that as an aside. You can keep going on Stevenson's Rocket. Wait, wait, wait. Whoa, you want to bring over chess lessons? What? Oh, you're saying you're going to return to this? Yes, I'm going to return to this. That's what I'm gotcha. saying. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then we've got My City and Babylonia left. So let's talk about Babylonia because we only played that once. I think it has some yeah. very interesting ideas. Yeah, I would play it again. I didn't love it. Um... I have a hard, I have a really hard time with these kinds of uh, abstract board manipulation games where you're claiming spaces. Yes, yeah, spatial stuff. Spatial stuff. Yep, yep, yep. So the first abstract games I learned as a kid were chess and checkers. I think like almost everyone, and I got good at them as a kid, and I think part of that was not really knowing what I was doing but learning to recognize patterns. Um, And then as an adult, getting into additional abstract games, I would say like Babylonia, but also games that you showed me um, like tech or even more popular ones, famous ones like Go. Um, Just trying to get into that pattern recognition is so tough as an adult. Um, And I don't really know why, Um, but Babylonia is one of those where I just didn't grasp what i was doing at all well someone who's played over 30 games of go entirely against other go newbies mm-hmm. and has never won uh i i totally understand with go for sure babylonia i think you can play babylonia two ways you can play it real casual mm-hmm. or you can play it real intense mm-hmm. that's my impression after one play because you could play it casual and you could have fun getting points here and there and seeing how it plays out if you really wanted to, you could sit there and really think through that game. Yeah. Because it's one of those games where the whole game leads up to the end state. Mm-hmm. And everything you do needs to have the end state in mind if you really want to play well. I mean, Stevenson's Rocket is like that to an extreme. If everything you're doing isn't trying to plan for the end game, and I'm just seeing you laugh here because <laughs> I just said something that makes you want to play the game less. <laughs> But with Babylonia, like the connections between your 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 locations and your your pieces are so important that everything from the very first or I guess second move uh, has to take that into consideration. Or you can play it chill, and I don't know if there's any in between there. Yeah, I will say the graphic design in that game is not doing it any favors. The board is kind of dark and murky. It could have been way better, 
uh, the pieces are fine, but the board itself is is not good in terms mm-hmm. in graphic design terms. Uh, it's hard to see what's what, uh, yeah. which is a real bummer when you're talking about a spatial pattern game <laughs> like uh, like that. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of potential there. A lot there of is. potential. There is. And I think the question is, do I want to put the time into unlocking that? I mean, I would. With abstract games, I don't know. I feel like it to really get good and to really have a satisfying time, you have to play with people who have mastered the game first or you're never going to get good. I don't think that's the case with this game. Really? I think it might be the case with like Go. Well, I, I'm not saying this game is as complex as Go for sure, but... I also feel like playing in our in our friend group where we've all played roughly the same amount of times isn't really going to do any of us any favors and may not make the game as engaging because it's I feel of... like on the second play I'm going to have a, a an immense immensely better understanding of what to do. I don't. <laughs> oh. Well, I think yeah, that's just our natural skill set I think that yeah. you, you have struggle a bit more with the pattern the the visual pattern recognition stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, although, by calling it an abstract game, that brings in another part of my battle line review, which, I th- again, I thought was quite good and you should read. <laughs> you, Amber, and also you listening to the podcast. Is that I've realized that I don't think abstract is the opposite of thematic. And I think a no. lot of people consider it that to be. You say that like it's obvious. Well, yeah. I don't know. Just <laughs> Just because you can't uh, describe it in concrete terms doesn't mean it doesn't have theme. But I think I think you know everything's abstracted. Obviously, every board game is abstracted. But when you talk about themes in literature, they're all abstract, right? Like, they're yeah. all these abstract ideas. There's nothing like it, theme isn't really it, it, theme is not a particular word or sentence. It's not a particular set of words uttered over and over. Theme. Theme is bigger than that. It, it is an overarching idea for the storyline. Yeah. Yeah. That, that comparison really makes my point really obvious. Like I should have thought of it well, that's what years I'm saying. ago. Abstract can be very thematic. We need to talk about these things more, Amber. <laughs> I need to bring you my board game theoretical conundrums more often because you just made that sound very simple. Yeah, obviously. I mean, if it's. Abs- I mean,. Even the most abstract game, like even Go, is like clearly about like military strategy and mm-hmm. positioning, uh, and chess even more so. It even mm-hmm. has militaristic pieces on the board. Uh, but a lot of people, I think, they conceive as abstract and thematic as two ends of a spectrum, and I don't think that's true at all. Hmm. Um, I think, and what I think is, as I said before, and as I wrote in my review, if you abstract really well, it can bring clarity to the theme. Now, in Babylonia's yeah. case. Yeah, I don't think it's <laughs> I don't think it's that thematic. It's it's mildly thematic, I guess, with this idea of like trying to claim uh fertile land and something like that. I don't know. I think it made sense. Sure. It, it's not something where I am overjoyed with the theme or think it's super interesting, but it made sense. But I mean, it does have in terms for people who think of theme as a matter of aesthetics. I mean, it is more aesthetically specific than Mm -hmm. some of his other games yeah but i don't think that's what theme is at all uh but babylonia a lot of potential i think could be very very good i'm glad i got it i got it on uh dan thoreau's slash aka space biff uh his recommendation because he named i believe his game of the year for last year or one of his games of the year Mm. i don't think he actually ranks his games of the year he has this whole production he does over a week but that one seemed like his favorite uh and so i I definitely put on my list and i can totally see why finally let's talk about my city knizia is i believe is first and only legacy game and it's such a knizia thing to do where legacy game is all about so far i mean there's only a handful of legacy games but most of them are all about like stories 
and uh, almost RPG-ish stuff. And he takes Legacy and he just makes a puzzle game. Mm -hmm. And every round you get a little couple tweaks to it. A couple tweaks to the puzzle to bend your brains in different ways. Uh, It's a very Canincia thing to do to make it like the most minimalistic Legacy system possible. I love it. I love it because it takes some of my favorite games like The Crew or other games where you're solving a puzzle either together or individually and it it builds so that the puzzle is new and interesting every time and you have some background and some history on it uh, but it's also kind of a new challenge every time so i love it i don't think of it as a legacy game like pandemic legacy or any of the big ones like that um but my city has been such a pleasure to play it's so every joyful time. it's yes, so yes. joyful and fun mm-hmm. you're just you're just putting the pieces together and we keep playing it like that's the i mean thing. last it's, time we played we played six games seven games in a row yeah it's not one of those games that you necessarily want to put down it's not like a chapter is concluded it's always Instead, you're looking for the next puzzle or seeing what's coming your way next um, and kind of filling with the pieces and making it work. It's fun. Yeah, I think we're now halfway through the campaign. I think it's 24 different games. Uh, each one's maybe, what, 40, 30, 45 minutes long? If that? Are they like 20 minutes? No, I think they're oh. a bit longer. than. Okay. I'd, I'd okay. say maybe 30 minutes. It doesn't feel even that long. No, I mean, <laughs> but last time I mean, we sat there and played six games in... Yeah, I think three hours. Yeah. Three, three and a half hours. And yeah, it presents you this this uh, uh, polyomino puzzle. So Tetris style pieces uh, on your little individual player board. Everyone at the in the very first game, everyone's got exactly the same situation because you just flip over a card to see what piece you're playing. Got to play that piece. And then as the game progresses, little every every time you get a new little nuance. And it's so smart in that 90% of what's happening you've already done before and you feel like you've done well at, or at least pretty well at. And then there's just a little wrinkle in it to make it a little bit more annoying. So you yeah. never feel like you're perfecting. Yeah. But you feel like you're really close. Well, and <laughs> and some rounds you do get close to perfect. Um, there, there have definitely been rounds when me or Ben feel like we have done really, really well. And it's near perfect. But then the next round you might be in last place. Because you, you placed the puzzle pieces at how you thought they should go. And you just guessed wrong. Or you didn't strategize correctly. Or luck was not on your side. Just something happened. Um, and and it I does feel, feel like... like it's ramping up a little bit, but I don't think yeah. it's going to get too wild in the second half of the Legacy campaign. Well, I thought using half the board was wild enough. <laughs> spoilers, Amber. <laughs> spoilers. Okay, yeah, spoilers. But yeah, it's just so it, it's so pleasant to play. The artwork mm-hmm. is very good. Cosmos did a great job with the production on this. Mm-hmm. Looks fantastic. I will say it has my one Legacy game pet peeve. That whenever or if ever I make a legacy game, I will never, never, never include, but it's been in every legacy game I've played, all three of them. And that is the very first thing you have to do in the game is name something. Oh, yes. I hate that part. I gave it my name because I don't like naming things. Designers, don't do this. I know that if you name something psychologically, you feel like... It's you know, more psychologically attached to it. I understand the studies and I understand the thought behind it. Have a little bit of the game so you can get some attachment and some interaction with the thing you're naming and then make them name it. Yes, Mark. But, but Mark, you're saying this and you do know that this is also my philosophy on children, right? Wait, what? I'm just saying... When we have a kid, maybe we should wait a couple months to name it. so 19th century. (laughs) Amber. But it makes so much sense. No, they only did that back in the day because the life expectancy was so low. You had like a 20-30% chance your kid wouldn't live to two years old. That was probably the predominant theory. No, that's literally what happened. But I bet you that some other people 
really thought that the name must reveal itself once you get to know the kid. Just a little bit. I'm pretty sure they don't let you leave the hospital until you've signed the birth certificate with a name. Some parents give placeholder names. We could give the child one of but our then names. We gotta, don't you have to like? Don't you then have to like submit a form? Yeah, you have to do a name change and all of that. All right. Well, y- if you want to do this, whenever we have kids, we'll talk about it. This is very weird to bring up for the first time in the podcast. Well, I'm just saying, like, I did the same thing with my cat. I waited, Yeah, we like, had to threaten you. Three months to name her. <laughs> we had to threaten you with naming the cat a ridiculous thing in order to get you the name to ca- the cat. But you gave me time. That's the key. You know how long it took me to name my cat? Like an hour? <laughs> yeah, you look like a little mouse, so I named a mouse. But my cat needed a regal name. And I gave you a list of hundreds of regal names. And I had to look through them and pick the right (laughs) one. Oh, gosh, this is terrifying. No, I'm saying that what you're saying right now, this naming philosophy... What are we going to call the baby? Extends to all life. Hello, son. Baby Mark. Baby Amber. We have options, Mark. No. (laughs) This is very weird. (laughs) I don't like it. I'll just name the child... But the thing with the kid is you have nine months. But you but you don't... Like, you will not have held the child <laughs> during those nine months. <laughs> it's a baby. It has no personality. How are you supposed to get... Like, a little cat has, like, a, a personality and a thing. A little baby has nothing. It just lays there and gawks. They have personalities and looks and cues. It'll look kind of like us. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> what? <laughs> You're very scared right now, I can tell. <laughs> I'm befuddled more than anything, Amber. But what you just said about games, it applies to all of life. Yeah, well now I'm designers. Make them name everything up front. Everything. Have them open all the boxes. <laughs> name everything that needs to be named. First thing. Don't get any, any ideas in your head regarding naming. Name things, you get attached to them in the end. Okay. Okay. Anyways, my city. Uh, <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I know this podcast is known for tangents, but that that was that's that one got me, and I'm usually the one who instigates ta- the tangents. Well, I'm I'm glad that I could surprise you a little bit. <clears throat> <laughs> what do we talk about next? What are we talking about? <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> Where's Reiner Kinizia to save me? Don't worry, Mark. Okay, let's talk about modern art because I thought we did talk. Did we? No, did I we, skip over modern art? We have not talked about modern art. Oh, there we, we need go. to talk about modern art. It's very good. Mm-hmm. The end. Very good. Mark <laughs> has all the has all thought left your brain yes. based on our tangent. Yes. <laughs> Take it away, Amber. I'm sorry, Mark. I'm sorry. All right. Modern art. In modern art, you. I'm, I'm probably going to misexplain the theme. But you are an art dealer who is trying to put forth pieces to manipulate the price of the up and coming artists that you want to see make it. Um, and while you're simultaneously buying and selling um, from your portfolio and from other people's at the game table's portfolios. Uh, and you want to. End up with the most money at the end. You want to be the most successful art dealer. Um, it's really interesting because you are kind of pitting yourself against the other players at the table. And I feel like this is a game where you play the other players far more than you actually play the cards. Um, it, it, there's a lot of people manipulation going on in this oh, game. Oh, there's so much game theory in mm-hmm. this. Yep. And this is one where I think, I mean, for Canizia, he went a little wild. He went a little crazy in modern art, mm-hmm. right? You you imagine, I don't know if you've seen Reiner Canizia here. I'll show you his picture. Where'd he go? Oh, he looks fairly normal there. Usually he looks he's, very normal. Imagine that with, <laughs> with wearing like a polka dot bow, bow tie. Okay. okay. That's, that's so, always his look at conventions, I think. So normal, but a little bit fun. Okay. And a little cheeky grin and mm-hmm. a little German accent. Yeah, you, you imagine him in his, his modest, you know, uh, pragmatic German way, and he's like, hoo-hoo, I'm going to put 
four different kinds of auctions in this game. <laughs> I'm going to go a little crazy today. Uh-huh. <laughs> I wonder what they'll all think of me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's what he did. He put four different types of auctions in the game. and It's mm-hmm. the wildest he's ever been. Yeah. and the, That the, I've seen. The type you, of auction that you... Again, I've only played 3% of his games. Yeah. But you get to decide which type of auction you offer up. And oftentimes, that decision, even if one type of auction, if everyone around the table was a normal, reasonable person, would clearly be one option. If the person sitting to your immediate left, you think you know what choices they're going to make, you can offer up a crazy random auction that makes sense to you, but that's going to blow their minds Look, it's so mad at you. Mm-hmm. I played this with one of my sisters. There was much yelling and screaming. Um, there wasn't that much. There was. There was. Wait, was this without me or are you talking about the last time we played? This was with uh, Deborah and Danielle. Yeah. It wasn't that much. Okay. Well, I thought there was. I mean, but... perhaps for a Kenita game, there was. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's just so much game theory in that. And, and, and it, it reminds me a little bit, and this is going to be a weird comparison, but it reminds me of Downforce. What? Why? In that, because whoever takes the early lead, if you go along with that and try to piggyback on the early leader, you're like guaranteeing for yourself second place. Right, so if one I may person need to play more downforce, if one person, oh, it's my biggest. I think downforce is brilliant, but no one plays it right, and it, it made me stop playing online. I can't do it with downforce. Right, here's what happens in downforce: one person gets ahead, everyone bets on them, and then everyone helps them win. That only makes that person win the game. Yeah, you have to play the spoiler in downforce. Well, I'm a contrarian, and I always bet on my own cars, but... Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, then you'll win sometimes, and sometimes you won't. Uh, but you have to play the spoiler. You can't just latch on to the person doing the best, because then mm-hmm. you just lose to them. Yeah. In modern art, right, if someone scores and gets, like, two of a particular artist, then maybe the next person throws out that same artist, right? The two players, or the three players who haven't played, they're in a position where... Each of them individually could try to piggyback on that. But if they do that, they're just playing for second place because the person who got to that artist first is going to be the victor and you're just helping them win more. Mm -hmm. The the remaining people have to play the spoiler and try to undermine that play. Mm -hmm. But it's this game theory situation where you have to... The incentives, if you really think about it, are about collaborating with the other players uh, unspoken... Uh, rather than just playing, oh, this is going to be the most valuable play I play it. You have to think about the future and how it how it mm-hmm. changes the behaviors of other people, how it influences other people. Uh, and that's why it reminds me of Downforce, and that's why it's a brilliant game. Mm. Um, and also, like we talked about, mentioned at the beginning, super thematic, in that it, it is a satire. Because it is a game in which the value of the art is nothing until that art is bought and sold, it is a satire of kind of manipulation in the art industry yeah i think some people go too far and be like it's a satire of capitalism but the fact that value of subjective is like a truth it's not about capitalism it's about specifically art dealers and how they do things to try to massively inflate the perceived investment value of the art that they're selling and that kind of stuff through this weird hype game and system uh, which uh, yeah, sure, yeah, that that's right for for satire. Um, it also applies to a whole lot of other things. Sure, but, but I yeah. think that most. Of, I mean, our, the art dealer world is so weird. <laughs> it is so weird. I don't know anything about it. Oh, it gets real weird. <laughs> um, there was that super unsuccessful Netflix movie. Remember that weird horror movie about it? I saw this. It was a bad movie. Yeah, I don't remember the name. Although of it. all the all the cool scenes are in the trailer, so you can watch all the best parts oh, in two that's minutes. Right. That's right. And then you don't have to worry about the rest of the movie. Literally the whole movie's in the trailer. That's right. So uh that's a nice shortcut for uh, a movie that had some interesting ideas but really failed. I can't remember the name of it. It was a, I think it was a Netflix original. Hmm. Anyways, modern art, great game. I mean, I think my three favorites right now are Modern Art Battleline and Stevenson's Rockin' and 
any of those could be my number one Canancia game on any given day. Throw Lost Cities in there, that could be my number one at any point. Uh, and they're all they're all just great games. Yeah, my top three are definitely Lost Cities. Battle Line has quickly become one of the top three. And I think it's kind of a toss-up between Modern Art and My City, but I think My City is currently winning out. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm curious. I, I hope My City gets a little more crazy, but not a lot more in the we'll second see. half of the of the campaign. And I hope it finishes in a good spot in terms of continued play. I'm curious. I'll be fine if we finish our 24 games and then we're kind of done with it, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm curious how good it ends up for continued play. Uh, anyways, that's Reiner Knizia, at least right now. I'm sure in a couple years I will have played more Knizia games and maybe we can do a part two on this. Because obviously, like I said before, he has over 600 games. I looked it up, I think 622 games as of right now. That includes ex- expansions and such, but I don't think he's much of an expansion person. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's mostly full-fledged games, uh, which is pretty remarkable. The good doctor, Reiner Knizia, what a guy, what a designer. I can't really speak to him as a person, but he seems nice in the interviews I've seen him in. Maybe next time I'll be able to, I'll, I'll try to contact him. It's not like I tried to contact him. I just figured I couldn't get him and uh, got Amber instead. No, this is an informal podcast. <laughs> Last minute podcast to try to get something out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this was fun. Thanks for podcasting with me, Amber. Of course. Even I though I kind of dragged you into it. I'll do it again sometime. You just always have to drag me into Everyone it. Everyone loves you, Amber. Every podcast you're on, they're always talking. Well, I enjoy they it. They like your insights. I enjoy it. I just don't play as many games as you. Very true. <laughs> uh, and more sane because of it. Except for the, the that naming thing. I don't know what's up with that. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, go ahead and check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. And if you haven't by now, read that battle line review because I want you to. You can support this podcast by going to patreon.com. You can also find me on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you could find Amber on social media if you got real stalkery. Yeah, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. I haven't maintained an account in, what, six years? Amber's a rational do person. Uh, don't try to find her. Whereas I'm I'm all over the place. I'm, I'm on social media left and right. It's mm-hmm. driving me nuts. Now I got like social media combined with other social media. I figured out how to post to Facebook and Instagram simultaneously. It's great. It's pretty soon. It's going to be all automated and I will never have to look at it again. Anyways, I'm on social media. Uh, Don't forget to rate and review the podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.